Today we're going to talk about what we mean by the directions cranial and caudal on a vertebra. In other words, which way is the front, which way is the back. Now this may seem like a, an amazingly boring subject or amazingly trivial, but like so many boring things, it's really necessary if we're going to talk the same language. And like so many trivial things, uh, it turns out to have implications. Let me give you an example. This very handsome vertebra on the right is the left lateral view of a dorsal vertebra of a sauropod Xenoposeidon, uh, which I and Darren Nation named in uh, 2007. And the most recent paper describing this has this five-point diagnosis. And the one I want to point out is uh, this particular thing. Neural arch slopes anteriorly 30 to 35 degrees relative to the vertical. And that red line shows you that slope. Now, how can we evaluate this unless we know what we mean by vertical? Uh, well, we know that vertical means at right angles to horizontal, OK. But what do we mean by horizontal? Well, it's the direction of the cranial caudal axis. Uh, but again, uh, which directions are those? Which way is cranial? Which way is caudal? We have a rough sense of it, but can we become more rigorous? It's important to be more rigorous because it, it affects things like this diagnostic character. Suppose the true horizontal position uh, is 10 degrees out from what I thought. Suppose the vertebra should be rotated backwards. Then, in fact, that diagnostic character is only that the arch slopes anteriorly 20 to 25 degrees. As one of the reviewers of that paper, in fact, argues that this is the correct position. Uh, and that became a, a discussion between me and him that was not based on uh, any objective facts, but just our sense of how we thought it, it looked most horizontal. Well, we want to be able to do better than that. Now, by the way, uh, I've been using anterior and posterior. I want to use cranial and caudal as the, the names of the directions in this talk. Cranial meaning towards the head, caudal meaning towards the tail. And the reason is that we're looking for truly universal definitions uh, of these terms that, that apply equally to stupid taxa like humans that have their vertebral columns upright and more sensible animals like horses that have them horizontal. And to clarify the problem, we're not at all talking here about life posture, which is a much more difficult problem. Uh, for example, here we see the head and neck skeleton of a cape hare. On the left, you see the vertebrae are articulated in uh, their osteological neutral position, which you might think is a reasonable way to reconstruct how it lives. But in fact, on the right, we see uh, something that's much closer to its life posture, where it's cranked up uh, past the vertical, uh, and x-rays of live hairs show that this is correct. Uh, so we really know very little about the uh, posture of extinct animals, particularly. Uh, and also consider the neck of this parrot that curves back in an S-shape. We certainly don't want to define horizontal as meaning a, an upside-down posture for the vertebrae in the middle of this sequence. So what we're thinking about here is a sort of ideal horizontal. If the vertebrae in an ideal horizontal position, uh, much like Ryder illustrated here in this Camerasaurus, the, the first known skeletal reconstruction of any sauropod. And you can see the neck and the torso are pretty much completely horizontal, as well as the uh, cranial part of the tail. So we're looking at consistency. We want these characters, like neural arch slopes, cranially 30 degrees relative to the vertical, to be objective measurements rather than something that's disputable based on uh, an aesthetic preference for which horizontal we think looks best. And consistency is hard to come by, particularly with sauropods. They're big animals, uh, and their vertebrae tend to be mounted in whatever way just uh, makes them sit most comfortably on bits of plaster or in, uh, even sometimes in the rock that they were excavated on. Here we can see a, a sacrum at top left, some dorsal vertebrae at top right, a uh, cervical bottom left, and a couple of caudals from near the base of the tail at bottom right, all of them oriented in ways that are just based on what kind of stands they happen to have. Uh, and in fact, it's even worse than that, because you get differing vertebral shapes not only across taxa and across regions of the spinal column, but even within the tail. Here we have a uh, caudal sequence from uh, another sauropod, and you can see that the more anterior vertebrae, uh, I should say cranial vertebrae in the top row, have their articular surfaces vertical. Uh, but later on in the sequence, we see that to get the horizontal axis looking horizontal, looking right, uh, we have those uh, facets somewhat tilted in various vertebrae. So how can we be consistent? And this is a question uh, of biological significance as well. If we want to answer questions like uh, what's the cross-sectional area of the neural canal, we can only do that if we know what direction we need to look at the vertebra at. Here we see uh, two copies of a digital model of the same haplocanthosaurus caudal vertebra. And you can see that the apparent cross-sectional area of the neural canal is very different, just because one of them is rotated slightly away from us and the other slightly towards us. So these are, are significant issues.
So what I want to do is offer you four possible definitions of what we mean by horizontal, and then we'll figure out which of those we think is best. The first one is maybe most intuitive is just that the long axis of the centrum is horizontal, and this is very appealing for elongate vertebrae, such as sauropod cervicals. This one is a fifth cervical vertebra from the giraffe titan lectotype specimen. Uh, of course, it doesn't work anywhere near so well uh, for tall and craniocordially short vertebrae, such as most caudals. Here we see uh, uh, the same, actually, same haplocanthosaurus caudal vertebrae we saw before. There it is from the back. Here we're seeing it uh, in a lateral view, but sliced in half. So we're just looking at the left side facing off to our right. Uh, and what's the long axis of that centrum? Well, there isn't one. And even with uh, these elongate vertebrae, it's not quite as straightforward as we think. So we want the long axis to be between uh, half height of the posterior and anterior articular surfaces. But where is half height? It's pretty easy here to spot where we think is the dorsal margin of those articular surfaces. But where's the ventral margin? There are several places, uh, both cranially and cordially, that are reasonable candidates. So until we can establish that, we can't really establish where's half height, and until we know that, we can't draw a line between them, and then we can't determine what the long axis of the centrum is in any consistent way. So here's a second possible definition. Let's say that we want to orient our things so that the articular facets of the centrum are vertical. And this is appealing for short, tall vertebrae like the haplocanthosaurus caudal. Uh, it is a little ambiguous because the anterior and posterior facets are not always parallel. Now in this case you can see that they're very close to parallel. We'll see a more pathological case a little later. Uh, but it's also difficult to determine this when you're dealing with facets that, that are not flat. So here we've got the concave uh, cranial facet from a Komodo dragon caudal vertebra. That's difficult enough. Uh, this convex caudal facet is even worse. Uh, how can you determine uh, what the orientation of that is and, and to define that as vertical? Uh, and even if we did, by the way, with a vertebra like this one, would we really want to define this as being what we mean by horizontal? Possibly not. And now consider this one. This is a vertebra from the base of the neck of a giraffe. And you can see that the anterior and posterior facets are nowhere near parallel to each other. Uh, and this is part of the reason that giraffes are able to have their necks habitually raised is because there's this keystoning effect in the vertebrae themselves. So which of those would we want to define to be vertical if we were trying to find this uh, neutral posture, uh, neutral orientation? Uh, difficult to say. Uh, maybe the worst problem with this definition of horizontality is that if we interpret it this way, it makes the neural canal jagged, and that is something that never happens in life. The spinal cord may curve, but it never kinks, as we can see in this conveniently hemisected horse head. So let's look at a third possibility. This time, let's make the neural canal horizontal. Uh, and here we can see I've uh, bridged across the, the base of the canal. Uh, and this gives very different results from method two. You can see that these vertebrae are 20 or 30 degrees out from each other. But this as well is ambiguous if the dorsal and ventral margins of the neural canal are not parallel, uh, which is often the case. So we would need to pick one and stick with it. Nevertheless, uh, it's, it's not a bad approach to take. Here you can see those Brachiosaurus caudals from earlier. And uh, Matt Wadel has used a low-tech leveling device, a roll of paper shoved through the neural canal to see that this is, is close to horizontal in this case. It actually needs to be rotated a few degrees. And the other thing about this approach is it's anatomically informative. And that's because it reflects the developmental sequence of the vertebra. The vertebrae form around the spinal cord. Uh, and as noted, although the spinal cord curves, it never kinks. So again, what we're seeing, if we use this interpretation, is something that more closely approximates the way animals actually work. But it's difficult to determine this in vertebrae that haven't been fully prepared or CT scanned. Uh, it's impossible to see in lateral view. Looking at the giraffe on the left, you could probably make a reasonable guess about where the base of the neural canal is. The Komodo dragon vertebra in the middle is harder. With Xenoposeidon, where would you even start? Uh, you would want to prepare the vertebrae out and look at it in three dimensions. Uh, it's, it, it's demanding. Uh, there's another problem as well, that whether the neural canal is horizontal depends on where you think the start and the end of the canal are, because of course we determine horizontality by drawing a line from the uh, start and the end. If we think that the cranial part is where I've drawn this blue line here, then we get this kind of definition of horizontal. But suppose we think this is the cranial extent of the neural canal and the vertebra, then we get this rather different slope. So we still have ambiguities to deal with. And here's an even worse case. Uh, 
here we're looking at a cross section of two consecutive human vertebrae. Uh, let's turn it sideways so we can see what's going on here. The neural canal running through as usual and the roof of the neural canal is completely convex. There's no defined cranial or caudalmost part and no straight line to measure. So how could we possibly define that to be horizontal? Difficult. So what I want to do is look at a method of defining horizontal that's based on the whole vertebra. Uh, not just the canal, not just the articular facets. And here's how I think we can do that. We can begin by depicting the vertebra in any orientation. It doesn't matter which orientation. Uh, and then you add another copy of the same vertebra in the same orientation. That's important. And then you articulate them as, together as well as you can do while keeping them both in the same orientation. You can't rotate one relative to the other. And once you've done that, you can then take the whole picture and rotate that together until both copies are at the same height. And then you can define this as being horizontal. Now note that this method uses two copies of the same vertebra. It doesn't require two vertebrae to do this. It's giving you a notion of horizontal for a single vertebra. Here's the same method applied to the fifth cervical vertebra of Giraffe and Titan. It gives us a result that we would think probably looks reasonable. Here's the more interesting case applied to that vertebra from the base of the giraffe neck. Now here we can see that the cranial and caudal articular surfaces uh, are not nicely aligned at all. We can see how much they're not parallel. And yet what we have here is a, a, a definition of horizontality and, and a way of articulating them that gives us a kind of compromise between what we might land up with if we were guided by one or other of those facets. So this is looking pretty good. Uh, the definition is less intuitive, it's less immediately straightforward than the first three definitions. Uh, you had to kind of explain it with pictures, you can't just say what it is, but I think it makes up for that in that it's more precise and that it constrains the subjective elements to just a single thing, which is how you best consider the two copies of the vertebra to be articulated. Uh, and it can be determined for any complete vertebra, irrespective of whether the articular faces are parallel or not, and whether the roof and the floor of the neural canal are parallel or not. So these are all arguments in favour of using definition 4. And we might also hope that this method is less vulnerable to yielding a distorted result when a vertebra is damaged, like this much more bashed up caudal vertebra from the same haplocanthosaurus we saw earlier. Uh, but at that point, as I was writing this and thinking, OK, so this is the definition we want to recommend, I ran into this rather obvious point. You can't do it at all for Xenoposidon, which is the vertebra we started with, and the vertebra that I most want to get horizontal. Uh, and the reason is because so much of it is missing. The, the front part of the, the vertebra is missing. The zygopophyses pre and post are both blasted off. How can you possibly determine what's an optimal articulation of two copies of this vertebra when so much of it is missing? You can't do it, is the answer. So uh, when, what, what are you going to do? Well, we floated all of these possibilities on our blog, Sauropod Vertebra Picture of the Week, or SV Power in short. Uh, and unhelpfully, really, all of the methods had their adherence. Uh, there was somebody prepared to speak in favour of each of them. Uh, and that reflects, really, the fact that no one method can satisfy all of our desiderata. So we have a weaselly conclusion to this talk, which is we advocate that each paper should explicitly adopt one of those definitions of horizontal, and whichever one it adopts, it should use it consistently. You may feel that's a feeble note to end on and that we ought to make some kind of recommendation. And I, I am actually going to do that. I'm tentatively recommending, uh, and Matt is in agreement, that using the base of the neural canal as horizontal may be the best approach we can make. In some ways, I prefer the similarity and articulation method, but the fact that it needs a much more complete vertebra makes it uh, pretty impractical for fossil vertebrae uh, when we use so often missing bits of them. Uh, but we're open to discussion on this. We're actively soliciting feedback. Uh, we would like to hear from you if you have a, a view on this. Uh, when we come up to write the paper, we may well mention you in acknowledgments if you have something interesting to say. But to summarise, what do we mean by the directions cranial and caudal on a vertebra? We don't really know. <laughs>